welcome to the first episode of Behind the Leaf, uh, Long Beach Collective Association's Cannabis Industry and Ab Advocacy Variety Show. My name is Stephen Contreras, Community Outreach Director. And I'm Pam, Community Education Director. Each episode of Behind the Leaf will take us on a uh, LBCA member facility tour. It will also, um, we'll get glimpses of cannabis history and also we'll have conversations um, all about can cannabis as cannabis touches a lot of different issues. On this episode of Behind the Leaf, we're gonna show you the Wonder Brett Cultivation Facility here in Long Beach. We're also gonna have an in-depth conversation between the hemp with Nate from Bell Costa and Gabe from Optimal Genetics. And lastly, you're gonna join Pam on Medicated History talking about the 1944 LaGuardia Port. Come join us on this episode of Behind the Leaf. All right, let's go. Hey, what's up everyone? Steven here, Community Outreach Director for the LBCA. We're at Wonder Brett Walnut Street facility. You know what? We're gonna check out, we're gonna introduce you to the brains behind the operation. Hopefully show you some cannabis. Come join me. I'm Brett Feldman, a co-founder of Wonder Brett. We are in our Long Beach Grow facility. It is 22,000 square feet, indoor cultivation, and we provide some of the best indoor cannabis to the California marketplace. So cultivation is a relentless job. It's every day, never stop. These are like infant babies that have to be taken care of and watered three and four times a day. They don't take a break ever. And at the scale that we're at, we you know, we have 36 bloom rooms here. We filling a room, chopping a room down every other day. So the pace just never stops. It's a train that will never stop from this point forward that we have started and uh, we, hate to, we hope to keep it going forever. The brand called Wonder Bread and I co-founded it with a partner of mine here and we are one of the very few fortunate people to found a great home in the city of Long Beach. We're really happy with the city. They give us such a, a, a great place to work out of. It's a big facility. There's 130 people here, so we got a lot of work going on. Long Beach is strategic, strategically located right off the 405 right here. The industrial zoning for the, where the location was, it's great to work here in, in SoCal and not have to be out in like the desert potentially. And it's closer to my home too. I, I've, born and raised in LA. So it's it's really just, you know, more convenient for us as a brand. It's strategic so we can be in, you know, SoCal the way we want to be. And uh, it helps us grow our footprint to have this scale into North, Northern California as well. So you, you need a lot of product to grow to, to be as, as big as we want to be and to provide as many stores as we like. So in, in getting started in this building here, I came in a little bit towards the tail end of the project, brought in as the, as the cultivation team and as a partnership in the brand with the owners of the building. But they had been working on the process for over a year and a half with the city. Two years, actually, I'm being told. <laughs> My earpiece. <laughs> and now we've been here running for about eight months. We're working out all the kinks of a massive scale operation like this. I'd say that Anybody who said they turned on anything of this scale and had it go perfectly from day one would probably be telling you some stories. Regulations and taxes are the biggest hurdles to every business in this space right now. You know, like an ounce of uh, alcohol gets taxed, I think at two and three cents an ounce. Whereas here, just for us to grow this weed, before we go to sell it, like that tax that you pay for alcohol is at the, at the counter there. The tax we pay here, we get taxed just for producing this pound of weed. Whether we sell it or not, I'm gonna get pay a $9.25 tax just for trying to grow it and producing it, whether I sell it or not. It's a very unfair system to marketplace that's trying to grow and it, it's, it's not how you would want to empower this new industry. I think that as cannabis has a, a stigma that it is, we're still getting punished from the old days. I still feel like the 37% tax at the sales counter is outrageous. I'm pretty sure when California voters decided to make this product legal and create this industry and the hundreds of jobs that we're supporting here, they didn't think that we were gonna do it at 37% tax and then taxing us before the product even got to the shelf either. I mean, there's multiple levels of taxes that people just don't understand. It's very complex for anybody to survive in this space. They're not making it easy. We have 
a very unique business model here that allows us to have a kind of immunity to what's going on in the marketplace where a lot of other brands are suffering because we grow all the product ourselves, we distribute the product ourselves, and we sell it ourselves to the stores, we can, we can still get some piece of a margin that allows us to want to be here and do this, but it's by no means in a heavily profitable industry. It's being taxed to death. If I sell a product at wholesale for $20 to a store, by the time the end consumer buys it, it's gonna be $60 or $65 plus taxes. So there's a lot of middleman in that space. And I'd say that, that the only person who's really made a lot of money in cannabis in the space for the past two or three years is the state of California. That they have collected you know, millions and millions of dollars uh, upon our investments and our hard work going into this space. There has to be a more sophisticated conversation that takes place for these guys to understand that they are going to kill this industry and completely, completely achieve the goal that they, uh, you know, the opposite of the goal that they set out to do in California. This is a, a voter state mandate that made this product legal. This can't be changed. This is what California's voted for. It's gonna stay that way. And uh, there's a lot of forces at be that are trying to strangle this market out. And they are kind of happy to see the black market thrive because it allows the second war on, on drugs to take place. You know, we're, this whole thing was legalized to take people that were getting marijuana cases and charged for this virtually harmless, very safe product to consume, take all these people out of this war on drugs and out of these jails. And it seems like it's a reinvention of that whole process again, the way that they're creating the system. I mean, you got a lot of people that have done everything they can to get their hopes and dreams into this space. They're getting their legs cut out from underneath of them at every different angle, from the way it, it, the licensing structure was put together and the timelines and the runway of capital that has to be spent to to before you can even operate. So it's, it's way more complex than anybody really understands. Okay, so in this Long Beach facility, this is one of the most sophisticated facilities I think built in North America. We go through very strict protocols of entering this building and, and how we move through the building, even in, in going from room to room. We have no outdoor clothes from outside of the world. Like what I'm wearing is my uniform that stays here inside this grow all the time. My shoes are, have never been outside of this building. They've only been inside this grow. And that's how it is for every employee. So we don't bring outside contaminants into the building. You know, we uh, have a UV air wash that will sterilize uh, as we come into the building too for every person who comes in. Uh, when we bring in products from the outside, we quarantine them, we UV light them, we uh, brush them off with air and, and, and try and keep as everything as, as dust and clean, uh, dust free and as clean as possible. Through every process, we take the plants from these veg spaces, we move them meticulously and carefully into the bloom spaces. As the plants get loaded in there, they get hooked up to the water systems, they get watered four times a day. They get netted, maintenance leaves are pulled off of them. These plants are touched every day, every plant basically that you see. There's 30,000 plants in this building, in this facility. Every one of these plants gets touched by a human every day at some point, once or twice. Through that whole process, we have our very meticulous feeding regiments so that we can produce the highest grade cannabis in the space. That is what I believe has led us to be immune to kind of the forces that are out there. We produce a very high end quality product that's limited to the marketplace and it allows us to kind of weather the storm that's going on out there. A lot of the people that are suffering are in the lower tiers that are duking it out for the, for the, the, the middle and the lower shelf. Not a lot of people built a grow facility with the intention of trying to make high-end cannabis at this scale. And this is what makes us unique here. As we go through that process, we harvest those plants down. When they're of mature age, we take them into the dry rooms. They dry for a week or two. When they come out of their dry, we go into our trim facility side of the, the building. There's about a 20, 30 man team of trimmers and processors in there chopping up the plants and getting things all hand trimmed, no machine trim. 
we try and keep everything as, as clean as possible from every process. Everything is tracked through metric. You know, you, you weigh the plant as soon as you cut it down, you weigh it when it's dry, you weigh all the stems, you weigh all the leaf, you weigh all the trim, I and mean, you weigh all the, the finished flower and you get everything into metric so that we stay compliant. So metric is the state's system for track and trace of plants throughout the building and how to keep the regulations so that they know that there's no, uh, you know, plants that are getting untracked. The, the system is a little bit uh, encumbersome. It's a little bit difficult to get used to. Certain aspects could be refined. The tracking of plants like this, great. You know, I, for me, it's the best data I've ever gotten in my life as a grower to be able to look at this information on a daily basis and make data-driven decisions and, and have all this information. Some of the things that are a little redundant and kind of unnecessary is the way that they make you track plants that are dead or that were never going to be a plant that was a clone that you, you know, that you're batching and you're labeling and you're entering the computer. And um, they be, add a lot of labor processes to the, the, the system that, you know, cannabis had never dealt with in the past. The whole market for California is, is a very mature market for smokers. People have been smoking cannabis in this state for 20, 30, 40 years, and they know what's good cannabis and what's bad cannabis. They have made so many more processes that have changed that business model. It is kind of historically, uh, an eighth of cannabis was like $50, $60 for a good eighth of cannabis. And this was 20 years ago. And even today, that marketplace, it has to kind of hold that value for people. That's what people believe cannabis is worth when they want to buy it. That's the value that everybody's agreed upon that that's what it's worth. When you start adding all these extra layers of metric and security, these are all these extra cost, costs that are associated that no grower in the California marketplace, when they established that price at $50 and $60, ever had to deal with, especially with the, the taxes for $150 a pound or $9.25 an ounce or the 37% tax at the storefront. It really has, you know, put a restriction and a stranglehold on the marketplace. Uh, there's only 600 stores roughly uh, that are open. So when you try and build something to scale and you realize you got to run out there with, because you have investors and you got to get out there, you got to get going, everything's costing a lot of money. You run out there and you realize there's really not a whole lot of places to run to. There used to be, in the Prop 215 era, I think more than three to 4,000 stores. So that was kind of the estimation of the marketplace, and we're supposed to have that many stores by now. But the state has moved really slow. Cities are moving kind of slow. Certain cities are still have a ban in their city on this stuff. Again, you know, the California voter I just isn't being represented the way I think we intended this to be. Yeah, so we, we chose this type of setup uh, for efficiency, for the best outcomes. This is like my dream setup as a grower. This double stack LED is very efficient. It's very organized. The impact for electricity and cooling is reduced. As a grower, it's, it really just is a farm. It's like any other farm. And farms have to have a very tight budget to survive. Um, even if you're just somebody growing walnuts or almonds, they have a lot more uh, subsidies, farming subsidies, the ability to borrow money from banks. Uh, we get none of these situations to help us. Lending and banking in this industry would be amazing. Subsidies to help support this industry would be amazing. Farmers markets for brands and for cultivators to be able to go to a, a fairground or something like that on a monthly basis, once a month, to have a, a shot at getting their products into the marketplace the f level of sophistication to get your product into the marketplace coming from a small farm is isn't achievable for most people to buy thousands of dollars of packaging, salesmen, deals with distributors. It's, they, they really have chopped the business into so many little pieces that you need to have all these licenses to have a shot at uh, to, of a sustainability in this marketplace. A, uh, the, if it had a, mar a farmer's market model, we would be able, every one of those mom and pop farms would have the ability to get at least one time a month to, to get some money in and pay their bills to keep their dream going and figure it out. If they don't, what are they gonna do? They're gonna go back to what they did in the past, which will be a black market grow, the exact opposite of what the California voter wanted. We wanted safe, regulated cannabis in this space and not to see our friends and family go to jail for something that is 
you know, the, one of the most harmless and safe things you could ever see. And it, it's just a plant. People are so scared of this plant for some reason for years and years. And even still, like the way I say, we still get treated like criminals in this space. We have, you know, regulators that show up and they're nice and stuff, but they show up in bulletproof vest. It just really makes feel everybody feel pretty uncomfortable and it makes you feel like they're here to try and catch us do something illegal or that we're all criminals, that we were criminals and we're still criminals now or something. It's just the tone isn't like it's, it's legal. Like the tone still doesn't feel that way. I think what really needs to happen is everybody needs to talk about cannabis more. Uh, the, till they're blue in the face, till their friends don't want to talk about and their family doesn't want to hear about it anymore. Because if you want change, this plant brings about change. This plant, in my opinion, it breeds compassion between people. It, it brings people together. When you smoke cannabis, people come together. It doesn't, you don't smoke cannabis and then look at somebody and go, like, what are you looking at? You know what I mean? Like, that's something that some other products kind of make you feel maybe aggressive, but not cannabis. So it has compassion built into it. From there, if we could have that conversation and talk about this, the more we talk about it, that's what actually influences society and cultural shift. And if we can change the conversation of the culture into a more uh, accepting place, then real change happens after that. You know, a lot of things that people looked at 20 years ago, like someone being vegan, they thought they were crazy. You know, now you can't go anywhere without seeing vegan stuff all over the menu. You know, so it's, it's just about changing this, the conversation and the culture of how we talk about cannabis and taking the fear out of this plant. This is not something to be feared. To be a very uh, good qualified grower, you have to have uh, dedication and love for this plant. If you don't really love cannabis, you won't put that energy into it. Kind of like anything, you know, if, if you don't like roller skating, you're never going to be a good roller skater. Mm -hmm. So if you find love for this and the way that it makes you feel and the way that it makes you feel around your friends and the shared experiences that it gives you, then I, then you're starting at the right place. From there, you need a really strong work ethic. You know, the best employees I've ever had historically over the years were guys that had come from other industries where they were breaking their back, you know, doing plumbing underneath a house or something like that. And, and then they came inside to this nice grow facility that's controlled, it's warm, it's, you know, you, all you had to do is just kind of listen to some good music in your headphones and work on the plants. And it's, it's kind of a very nice, relaxing, uh, meditating almost type uh, environment when you, when you uh, get into the cultivation space. It becomes very calming, a very home feeling. Okay, so I have a qualm with the term master grower. <laughs> the people like to throw it out there like they're master growers, but uh, I'd say like a chief grower or the, the head grower or something like that, because master is so egotistical and, and no one's ever gonna master this plant. No one can master it. Uh, it's untamed, it's wild. Basically, you can be a very experienced grower and be a head you know, of the cultivation. And at head cultivation, uh, a guy, for his salary, normally gets anywhere from like 80 to 120, 120,000 a year, depending on his level of skill and how many head cultivators are there. People think that, maybe you're assuming right now that I'm the head cultivator here and I make every decision completely wrong. Um, I make decisions for my brand. I have a huge team of people that support us here, people that do data collection, people that are working on the plants people that are helping develop our ethos for our company, the way that we want to present ourselves to the community. It's not contrived, it's organic and original. It's just, we put a lot of thought into how this is. We want to change the conversation. We want the culture to shift and we want real change. And changing the world through plant of cannabis, I can't think of something that would make me feel, feel more proud to be a part of. and. and and employing hundreds of people along the line, you know, not just the people that are in this building, it trickles down into distro companies and sales teams and bud tenders and shops. And it, it just keeps going. Like this is probably one of the most, you know, fast growing sectors for jobs in, in the country maybe, you know, like I bet you we're up there with tech.
you know, on, on growth and expansion. There's so many more people now that can feed their family in the state, in the city of Long Beach, you know, because of city of Long Beach side, they're open their arms up wide and embrace groups like myself and, and allow us to do this. This is amazing. So uh, we have about 140 employees here right now. Um, when we started onboarding the facility, we um, went directly to the social equity program and got as many people as we could. Um, from there, we kind of exhausted that list and uh, started hiring more people from there. Um, not everybody in the social equity program worked out for us. Um, we've retained about 30 of those people on staff right now and they've worked out great. Um, working with uh, the city of Long Beach hand in hand on this process has been just amazing. Uh, you know, being a grower and hiding in the shadows for years of what I was doing and never really having any interaction with, you know, authorities or the city or voicing anything, um, you know, for so many years and finally being able to actually have this conversation and talk about it and be a part of conversations with the city, uh, it's, it's really, a dream come true for me because I've always dreamt of cannabis being legal, respectable, classy, and not the stereotypical stereotypical image that they've painted in all the movies, which is very fun and you know funny for and entertaining. I love those movies growing up, but it's not a real depiction of the average consumer of cannabis. So uh, no, we don't do any drug testing here in, in the facility on our employees. Um, we do do. Uh, drug testing for any of our drivers for distro, because that is the law. Uh, we follow everything to the letter of the law here. We are not gonna ruin this opportunity or let this turn into something that's a, you know, a bad thing for the city. We're gonna do everything we can to protect this and keep it pure and good. I just wanna say uh, thank you to everybody uh, in Long Beach for allowing us to cultivate in your city. Uh, we're really thankful. We feel very blessed to have this opportunity and uh, we will make everybody in this city very proud. Thank you. I just want to thank my mom and dad for <laughs> letting me get away with growing pot in their house, you know, and uh, learning how to do this. <laughs> thank you. So we just finished our tour. You checked out the grow, you saw the water, you talked to Brett, you know what? Go try some of your the Wonder Bread today. Good yeah. evening. Oh, here. You yeah. first. You first, man. Yeah, I think that's sure. The way Whatever. To go. Yeah. So uh, we are your hosts for uh, Between the Hemp. I'm Gabe Rodriguez. I'm the Chief Science Officer of Optimal Genetics. My name is Nate Winokur. I am the Bell Costa Labs VP and very happy to be here tonight. So thank you guys for having us. Uh, we are very excited to be the guest hosts for this. In fact, we really want to have an opportunity to kind of introduce the whole sort of science and education part of the industry. This is some stuff that we're really big about and we want to have the opportunity to kind of use this soapbox and platform to talk about that as much as humanly possible. So Gabe, what are we here to talk about? Yeah, of course. Um, so, you know, like Nate was saying, we should definitely touch on the back end of the industry. All you guys really get to see is uh, the dispensaries, the, the consumption side. Um, I feel like you guys should get a good touch on how your extracts are made, how is all the lab side of things being created so that you guys could be safe. You guys could smoke a good uh, product that you know you could feel confident in smoking and sharing with your family or your friends, you know? And I think that's what we're here to touch on right now. So um, I think we could start touching on different types of extraction and why we use these different types of extraction to do what we do. So uh, right now we have a, a couple things on the board right here. Um, we have some BHO from Connected. 710s has their uh, rosin. Mm -hmm. And then I have some carts from my company, Optimal Genetics, that we use a uh, ethanol extracted distillate. So It's all good stuff. 
Yeah, exactly. Awesome. I'd hope to think that, yeah. We definitely are picky smokers. All right. So, well, maybe we should try some of this out as we go forward. What is your favorite extraction method and why? <sighs> All right. Well, um, definitely my pedigree that I have behind me is uh, butane extraction. I've been extracting with butane for since about 2013. So back when uh, glass tubes were still a thing. Uh, well, thank goodness you were using glass and not PVC, right? Absolutely. That was I didn't thing. want to, I didn't want anything to leach into my into my smoke. I want it to be so somewhat Should we explain what we're, you know, let's oh, let's, dude, let's, absolutely. let's dissect this a little bit. So, once upon a time when people found out that you could make extractions from butane, what we ended up seeing people do was at first people needed a place to do it. So, typically your backyard or your garage, mm -hmm. sometimes a hotel room with uh, plenty of, you know, random sparks was the place to go. Yeah, of course. Um, next, and carpet. And lots of carpet. <laughs> next, you would need a tube, and this tube would be packed full of cannabis. And often people, without even thinking that solvents would be able to leach chemical from these tubes, right, mm -hmm. would reach for the cheapest, most available thing. And they would just reach for PVC this chunk of PVC plastic. tube plastic. And it was a terrible idea. Mm -hmm. And what you would do, just to you know, give you all the, the, the complete blueprint of uh, how to do something illegal in your backyard, <laughs> is they would pack it full of cannabis, and they would drill little holes on either end, and they would fill it full of butane, like straight out of the canister, oh, yeah. and then right into a dish. Into an open and dish. Assuming you're surviving at this point and that oh, yeah. you've neither blown yourself up from the butane nor be attacked by bees from the fumes, mm -hmm. now we're hoping that you have the opportunity to boil all this butane off and now you collect all of the sticky poison that's left over. Butane and call, hash oil. And, and call it good and call, it, yeah, call yourself yeah. a genius for circumventing the system. Call yourself an extract artist. So... As much as I like to, to uh, clown on this, I think this is where a lot of us kind of started. I saw something wrong with the PVC type pipes. Absolutely. I used the glass tubes too. I was using glass tubes and to even take matters even higher. Um... Like I was doing it right back then. I wasn't doing it right. <laughs> yeah, that was the no. one thing I did right. I used glass but tubes. But I mean like, uh, you know, I did my due diligence. I, I did know that... Uh, Removing undesirables from your extracts, such as like fats and lipids, you know, it was due to having cold solvent and being able to separate those things. So what I would do is I would open blast, mind you, into a mason jar that was covered around dry ice in a small cooler. And I would let that separate for 24 hours, and then I would have a hand-pumped uh, uh, Buckner funnel. Okay. So I would have, a, you know, a glove that I could strain all my solvent into. And I would hand pump that's through smart, a Buckner punnel yeah, that's smart. so that I could de-wax. And the whole point of it was that, you know, back in the day when you had shatter and it would butter up, it's because people thought it had butane in it. You know, mm -hmm. they were like, oh, that, sh that stuff sugared up. Like, I can't sell it anymore. It has butane. And then I'm like, oh, it just hasn't been properly made. It wasn't de-waxed or whatever it was. And I would get to go to a shelf having three to four times the shelf life than other types of shatter. So by the time that the consumer got it and smoked it, it was still perfect, you know? So I, I tried to make, some. I tried to make the worst situation a little bit better, you know? Uh, slowly graduated to a precision in around 2014. Uh, from there I've used, you know, Bogart V1, V2, V3. I use a Sweet Leaf V1, V2, V3. Um, designed several Busy Bee machines with Boris. So, yeah, I think uh, for, my take, hydrocarbons are easily some of the best solvents to use, especially since it takes technically the least amount of energy consumption to do that. You're using a non-polar solvent, and cannabis is a polar cannabinoid. So having that positive and negative just pushes everything down so much easier. It takes less work and everything. Ethanol, they're both polar, so it's a lot more you know, agitation and energy to really get all those cannabinoids out of there. So, you know, using BHOs is a good starting point. You know, it's at that base on a chemical level. It's kind of like, yeah, that's, that's how sh we should start. Good words. Good words. So you prefer butane. Yeah. I'd like to think that butane extract is kind of the 
heart and soul of good quality, like the origin of what a good quality extract was. Absolutely. I think once upon a time, people...